<clears throat> all right. Um, first and foremost, we want to give all praises, all honor, and all glory unto the Most High God, Yahweh. We do so in the name of His only begotten Son, who the world calls Christ, Yahweh Shai. It's your brother, Chief Priest, Alazar Maloya, aka the Gorilla Hebrew. This is Hassad. <laughs> I just, just don't know why you did that. I don't know why you did the intro like that. Like, but uh, okay, I'll take it. I'll accept it. I'll give y'all a second to get up in here through the spirit. But all praises, man. Hope everything's on cool. Hope this hell isn't too unbearable um, for y'all. You know, Shalom, Shalom. Give y'all a second to get in here again. We're getting ready to get started. So, like it, we didn't have class. So, I want to update y'all on class schedules as well. Y'all know we've been doing this late Tuesday night slash early Wednesday morning thing. Um, We've been doing that. Uh, so, um, and then we, we did a class. We did the Yassar class Monday. All praise the most high righteous say. Um, but we didn't have class this past Monday. Um, Monday class will be back next week. Okay. Um, next Tuesday, we, we won't be having class next Tuesday or... Wednesday for Situation Room going into the summit. We won't be having either of those. Um, or will we? No, I think we should. We, should. we could Tuesday. We no, could. yeah, no, we'll be fine Tuesday. Yeah, we'll be Monday and Tuesday. Look for classes both of those days. There's no Situation Room next week. Look for no Situation Room next week. Um, it's a lot. Yeah, no Situation Room next week. Uh, leading into the summit, we should have some some pre-scheduled premiere programming through the Spirit of Power. Y'all about to see me shot coming next week, so y'all look for that. Um, what else? Uh, we should have some live streams as well from the summit. Summit Unity Camp. We should be live streaming next Friday. But as we talk about the summit, let me make sure I'm plugging the summit. We got it going down. In Atlanta, Georgia, Mashara Yashwala Summit 12 through the Spirit and Power of Yahweh Hashem Yahweh Shai from January 24th to the 27th there in Atlanta, Georgia. New update on the location of the meet and greet. The meet and greet is at 5.30 p.m. Mont Avenue Northeast there in Atlanta. Uh, begins at 5 Thursday, January 24th. We got camp starting at 5 um, January the 25th that Friday at 5 points. And then uh, starting at noon, we got the Sabbath Service and Summit. That'll be taking place at 879 Ralph David Abernathy uh, there in Atlanta on the West End. And then uh, the cookout location is still to be determined. If you are at the other uh, events, uh, you'll definitely get the information passed as to where the location of the cookout will be. Or if we know any sooner, I'll put out a revised flyer. As some of y'all know the meet and greet location change, so a revised flyer is out. That's what y'all looking at now on your screens. Um, through the spirit and power of Yahweh by Shem Yahweh Shai. Anything coming up in San Diego? Camp every Saturday. That's where you should be at. Um, Mario Leon, save your questions for the end. We may open up for questions and answers. You're yeah, asking some decent questions, so save it for then. San Diego, camp every Saturday. That's where you should be if you're in the San Diego area. Um, that's at 4th and Broadway or um, what they call Horton Plaza Park which I believe is 904th Avenue so all praises to Yahweh by Shem Yahweh Shai like, share, sub and super chat alright so we're going to get into it we're going to get into it 
next week, because what we're going to be doing, we're going to be finishing this first section off. Um, which to, today we plan to do the Spirit and Power of Yahweh by Shimei Abishai, um, finish Genesis out. Genesis will be done. And we had, had finished out Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. So when we start our new cycle, we'll be going into the historical portion of Exodus as well as Deuteronomy. So that's what we'll start out at um, either next week or the week after. We will we'll do, do class next week. We might just do an open forum class next week, open up for questions and things of that nature next week, and then start back on the portions when we get back from the summit, I think. I think we'll do something like that. But y'all stay tuned. But yeah, so most of what we're going to finish out Genesis and Numbers today. So let's go to Genesis 47. And we're going to start there at the top. And we're going to read all the way to the end of the book of Genesis. Alright, so all praise to y'all. by Shimmy Shai again. Y'all like, share, sub, and super chat. Okay. This, go ahead. This is Genesis chapter 47 verse 1. Uh-huh. It says, Then Joseph came and told Pharaoh, and said, My father and my brethren, and their flocks, and their herds, and all that they have, are come out of the land of Canaan. Uh huh. So everything they got, all of Israel now, and everything that Israel possessed. When I say Israel, not just the man, of course, the twelve patriarchs, uh, the children that they had at that time, their wives, their servants, all the cattle. It's all now coming to the land of Egypt. Read. And behold, they are in the land of Canaan. Uh huh. Like it, Goshen. They're now in Goshen, read on. It That's where we are. Go ahead. It says, And he took some of his brethren, even five men, and presented them unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto his brethren, What is your occupation? What do y'all do? Right, read. And they said unto Pharaoh, Thy servants are shepherds. Uh -huh. We are shepherds. As we know as we went into last week, being a shepherd is an abominable occupation in the eyes of the Egyptians. What we do in our lifestyle is is looked down upon by those Hamites. The same way what they do in their lifestyle is looked down upon by us. We see this expressed through the codification of the Torah when we're constantly urged to not follow in the ways of the Egyptians whose land we left. They hated the way we lived. We hated the way they lived. And we see this the world over with people. With, with people's cult. People don't like people's... For example... I was talking earlier, and uh, Ishmael, the Arabs, came up, right? And I made a, 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 a snide remark about them being camel jockeys, right? Us now, and though we are certainly Hebrew Israelites, we're a student of the Bible, we are, you know, reconnecting with our Hebraic culture. Um, we very much so grew up in a westernized society. There's no way around that. And there are... It's various ways that Western society has molded our minds and what we think is um, right and wrong, what we think is societally acceptable, what we think is cool, bearable, etc. Western society has certainly helped f uh, shape our minds, whether we admit it or not, maybe more than we would like to admit sometimes. With that being said, for me to say negatively about an Ishmaelite that he's a camel jockey, why am I saying that? Because to us here, living in the Western so-called hemisphere, in the what, the what you would call the Western world, being a camel jockey is an abomination. It's something that's disgusting and filthy, and only primitive Arabs do it. But if you take a look at the Arabs, they look at you know riding camels as you know a noble thing, uh, something that you know is chivalrous and that you would look up to if you would go over there to you know, Arabia and the Middle East and, and analyze their culture. See, so who's to say who's right or wrong? Is riding a camel wrong morally or ethically? Of course not. So it's just a societal opinion. So is there anything wrong with us being shepherds? No, they just don't like it because that's just not their way of life. It's not a way of life that they understand in Egypt. The same way we don't understand their way of life. You understand what I'm saying? So there are certainly certain aspects of the way of life that are abominable and disgusting and deplorable and should be condemned. But there are certain ways to their way of life that aren't necessarily wrong, but we just don't agree with them because they're not our culture. You see this in cultures all over the world. 
right? So read on. It says, Thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. Uh -huh. They said moreover unto Pharaoh, For to sojourn in the lands are we come. Of course, righteous hate the Egyptians that enslaved the Israelites were black or, or dark skinned, uh, negroid, phenotypically people. Right, so read that uh, from where you picked, where, where you started at. Come, that back. Genesis chapter forty-seven, verse four. Uh -huh. It says, "They said moreover unto Pharaoh, for to sojourn in the land are we come. Uh -huh. We came here so we can live here. We need to journey here for a time, because of the dearth famine in the in our land. Read. Come, it says, for thy servants have no pasture for their flocks. Mm -hmm. for the so what we are shepherds. It's our occupation. It's our way of life." But in the land that we are coming from, it's totally barren. We don't have a place for our cattle and our sheep to graze. So we need to come to a place that can facilitate such a thing. Right? Read. Come. It says, For the famine is sore in the land of Canaan. Mm -hmm. Now therefore we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Uh -huh, go ahead. And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. Mm -hmm. The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land, make thy father and brethren to dwell. So the Pharaoh said, listen, here's your brother. Here's your brothers, rather. Here's your father. You have power over Egypt. I've given you this power. Give them whatever you like in this land. That's how much favor Joseph has. So all of this was set up in the spirit. Read. Come. It says, and if thou knowest any men of activity uh -huh. among them... Then make them rulers over my cattle. Uh huh. So, matter of fact, let's go to what what, what verse is that? Verse six. Genesis forty-seven and six. Let's take a look at this. We're a man of activity. Strength, might, efficiency, ability. Okay. Man of activity. So you're a man that's able. Make him ruler. Basically. The best of your brother, put them over our cattle, the Egyptian cattle as well, right? Because it's not even a, a job that Egyptians would like to do, right? So read. Come. It says, And Joseph brought in Jacob his father, and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are an hundred and thirty years. Mm-hmm. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been. You see that? And we always analyze what Jacob says here. He's 130 years old. And he described the days of his life as few and evil. Now you would think a dude who lived to be 130 would, you know, optimistically look at his life as long. So now we had to analyze the things that Jacob went through that would make him say that his days were few and evil. I mean, one, he got his brother trying to kill him um, during, during a certain part. During the time where his brother's trying to kill him, he's working for a, a, a trickster and a swindler uncle. He obtains two wives there who are sisters who have a bitter sibling, sibling rivalry that he has to consistently deal with. Um, you know, he ends up working 14 years because of the trick gets out, is in fear for his life because of his you know, evil twin brother. Uh, after that, you know, he goes into the land of Canaan. Here you got Levi and Simeon starting all kind of trouble. After that, you have Joseph who's seemingly dead. Then his favorite girl died. You see what I'm saying? So he went through a lot of stuff in his life. And that could be the only reason to why he would describe the days of his life as few and evil. Right? So read. Come. It says... You and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers. Mm -hmm. They're not like Isaac's life. It wasn't like Abraham. He's weighing his life versus Isaac and Abraham's life. And he's saying that these brothers lived longer and better lives than me. They had less trouble than I had. And it, it it's true. I mean, if you've been... Going over the course of this journey now. This is now our 12th. Is it 12? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Hold on. 9, 1, 2, 3, 4. Oh, so like it. This is now the ninth week that we've been reading Genesis. So we start with Eber. We read about Abraham, Isaac, and now we on Jacob. And if you analyze 
number one, the uh, amount length of time of the lives of these three men and the exploits of these three men. Jacob clearly had the shortest and the least peaceful life out of the three. So he's comparing his life versus Isaac and Jacob, and he's saying, my days are few and evil compared to theirs, right? And that's true compared to theirs, right? But compared to the lives that we live now and the experiences that we go through now, Jacob had an exponentially great life. You see what I'm saying? But he's weighing it against Isaac and Abraham, understandably, because that's his foreparent, right? Read. Come. It says, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out before, it says, and went out from before Pharaoh. And Joseph placed his father and his brethren and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. Mm -hmm. In the good in the good land, in the best of the land of, of Egypt that was ideal for the grazing of cattle, Joseph placed this in. So read. It says, and Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all his father's household with bread according to their families. And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. Mm -hmm. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought, and Joseph, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? Give us bread. So we have to understand what's going on. We have a shortage of bread. We have money. We have, it says, Joseph took all the money out of Egypt and of Canaan. This is important to understand. Because we there's something political that's in that subtext. The political thing that's in that subtext is that part of Canaan was annexed by Egypt. The part of Canaan that was annexed by Egypt is known as the, the land of the Philistines, or Palestinian, or what they call Palestine today. They loosely refer to the whole region as Palestine. The whole region is never and was never Palestine, though. But there was a part of it the part nearest to Egypt, stretching up and around into the Mediterranean region, is Palestine. That was where the Philistines went and annexed and colonized out of Egypt. So now you have a part of Canaan that literally is under the, the political jurisdiction of Egypt during this time period. And that's why he's going and getting all the money of Egypt and Canaan. Because politically a part of Canaan belonged to them was in their jurisdiction all right that's where the philistines as we see goliath and various other individuals these are actual egyptians that had went and colonized a part of the levant region or um canaan you see what i'm saying so when you deal with the philistines they're separate from the canaanites they're a whole different breed of hamite they come from mizraim rather than canaan you understand what i'm saying so it's important to understand these things Right. Go ahead. It says, for why should we die in thy presence? So basically, they, they got a welfare program. This is also what has to be understood. They're going and just saying, give us bread. Why are they saying, give us bread? They need bread. There's a lack of food. There's a famine. They need to be provided for. They need to get rations of food. This is what happens during times of austerity, which we may see here in America soon enough. You know, food stamps and WIC... Wicked shut down, I believe, but food stamps, they 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 would approve EBT this month. It's not going to be approved next month if this government stays shut down. What are people going to do is the question. You see what I'm saying? So these type of hardships are hardships that we may be soon experiencing. They experience it during different times in history, even here in America, the Great Depression, etc. You have food rations because you're in a time of austerity, a time of drought, a time of famine. It's what they experienced there in Egypt during this time. Right? So read. Come. It says, And Joseph said, Give your cattle, and I will give you for your cattle, if money fail. He said, Listen, you ain't got no money. Give me your beasts. Give me your animals. 
and will give you food predicated upon the monetary value of your animals, read. It says, and they brought their cattle unto Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses, uh -huh. and for the flocks, and for the cattle of the herds, and for the asses, and he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. Uh, no money, bring me the animals. Go ahead. When that year was ended, they came unto him the second year, and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord, how that our money is spent. We ain't got no money. All the people in the land are coming and saying, listen, Joe, we ain't got no money, man. Read. My Lord also hath our herds of cattle. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies and our lands. So not only do we not have any cattle, I mean any money, we don't have any cattle. That's how we was getting food from you from before. So the only thing we got left is ourselves and our land. Read. Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, but we in our lands? Uh-huh. Buy us and our land for bread. Buy us and our land for bread. So now you have people, Egyptians, Canaanites, Philistines. They're now selling themselves. They said, buy us. We'll read that part again. Come, buy us uh -huh. and our land for bread. You see, this is what happens in time of desperation. In times of desperation, if all else fails and you have nothing else, people will sell themselves. You get ready to see. Listen, again, let Trump keep this government shut. Let me explain something to you. I've been in this truth for upwards of a decade by the grace of the Most High and the spirit of Mashiach Yahushua. In the upwards of a decade, I've heard them go back to the floor and discuss this government shutdown time and time again. And every time they do it, I go, I wonder when they just going to finally let this mud be shut down. I wonder when. The Most High put the devil in office to do it, Donald Trump. Everybody else played with it. Obama played with it. Because Obama, I mean, I was, I came in the truth at the very, t at the tail end of the Bush administration. So, essentially, Obama was the president damn near my whole time in the truth and then now Trump. So Obama would, they might let it go to, shut down for a weekend. Then they approve a, a, a temporary budget. Boom. They keep it going. So I saw them put Band-Aids. band, -Aids, band -Aids, But I said, ain't but so many Band-Aids you can put on this. Because it's dealing with cash, money. You know, there's only but so much money you can keep printing up out of thin air. You know what I mean? So when is it finally going to hit the fan? So now here it is. And it's, how, I mean, how long have we been shut down for, it, officer? I would say like a few, at least, at least like a week or so. No, it's been a couple of weeks. Couple of weeks? Government been shut down for a couple of weeks. Somebody in the chat may, may know. God. Somebody in the chat may know. Let's let them catch up. federal government's partial shutdown became the longest in American history on January 12th, stretching into its 22nd day. So, 22 days on the 12th, somebody just said 25 days, so we get 25 going into the 26th day. So, we're coming up on one month of the government shutdown, right? It ain't fully set in yet. Once EBT is cut off, I just talked to my grandma earlier about this. Once they shut that EBT down, it's going to get real. And you're going to see people selling themselves. What do I mean by people selling themselves? Women are going to be selling their bodies. You have women, and guess what? We're in such a degenerate time, men is going to be selling their bodies. People aren't going to know what to do. If you're a, a single mother, and the only way you are, have been feeding your kids consistently for years is through EBT, what are you going to do when there's no EBT? And how do you think the job market is going to be affected by a federal government shutdown? Do we understand that when a when a, 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 a president or any politician 
promises jobs. You ever heard of they promise jobs? The only way that a, 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 a federally elected official can promise jobs is that they're going to approve federal funding that is going to create jobs. If the government is shut down, the federal government, then there's no federal funding to fund the jobs that they would have created. So then the rejuvenation that they allegedly planned to or did bring to the job market has now totally declined and decreased. You see what I'm saying? So the best bet is going to be the tax refund because they just got me 46,000 furlough IRS workers go their ass back to work for free to make sure everybody gets their tax return. See what I'm saying? So Trump going to say, I'm going to cut this. I'm going to still give y'all this good earned income tax credit, but I'm going to cut that off. You're going to have to wait. Boom. So February, Black History Month, that he said he's going to do make this. A, didn't he say he's going to make this a special Black History Month for us this year? 2019? How are you going to make it special for us? And the government is shut down. The oh, government. Right. Yeah, the go- oh, yeah, he ain't getting you. He wasn't lying. I'm going to make it special. There's going to be no EBT. Real special. Right? On top of that, the government so goddamn broke. DJ Trump got everybody McDonald's <laughs> for dinner the other night. We got, we got uh, 300 hamburgers and lots and listen. Folks, lots of French fries. <laughs> All of our favorite foods. <laughs> That's a real devil. The most high is cold, man. Only the most high could have put him in office. Let me tell you that now. Only God. See what I'm saying? So the same way now, like we're reading about in Egypt, when the famine got so bad, people started selling their self and selling their land. We may be seeing that soon. We've been talking about it for so long. It may be getting ready to happen. And if not, it's going to happen soon. All hell getting ready to break loose out here. I'm telling you that now. That's right. If it doesn't happen during this government shutdown, it's okay. It's in the near future because the Bible says so. That's right. So read. Tom, it says, Salakia, buy us in our land for bread and we in our land will be servants unto Pharaoh mm-hmm. and give us seed that we may not that we may live and not die that the land be not desolate mm, that the land be not desolate right so not only listen we'll sell ourselves to you give us seeds read and Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh mm-hmm. for the Egyptians sold every man his field so it say he sold every man so you have land there that's privately owned it's private owned. It's now property of the state. Right? Read. Because the famine prevailed over them, so the land became Pharaoh's. Uh-huh. And as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt, even to the other's end thereof. Mm-hmm. Other end thereof. Verse 22. Only the land of the priests bought he not. Mm-hmm. For the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh, and did eat their portion which Pharaoh gave them, wherefore they sold not their lands. Then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Joseph said, I own you, and I own all your land on behalf of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. This is a huge lick for the Egyptian government at this time. Right? Read. Come. It says, Lo, here is seed for you, and ye shall sow the land. So here, take some seed, plant seeds. Meanwhile, we own you niggas, right, Read. And it shall come to pass, in the increase, that you shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh, uh-huh. and the fourth part shall be your own, uh-huh. for seed of the field and for your food. So he said 20% now. So I own your land, we own you, we will give you seed, and 20% of all that you produce is coming back to us. Oh, so I don't see it. Oh, Derek Yehuda, Yahweh, by Shem Yahweh, Shah Barak, and Thawath, the water. Again, for the continual, very gracious support and donations, brother. We greatly appreciate you, King. Go ahead. It says, uh, for seed of the field, and for your food, and for them of your households, mm-hmm. and for food for your little ones. Uh-huh. For your children, right, Reed? And they said, Thou hast saved our lives. Mm-hmm. Let us find you. So they were grateful. See, this is how crazy it is, man. Um, when people are in dire straits, you could be doing something that seemingly is helping for the moment and they'll sit there and look at you and say, you saved our life. 
But what we just read about is you got screwed. It's like when, you know, y'all be down on money. Your family's down on money. Here come the white man. He come with something called a reverse mortgage. It sounds good. You get money now. Sounds great. Five years down the line, though, you got to get the hell out of your house. Because it's their house. And now you're in a worse position than you were when you started out. You see what I'm saying? It's what people aren't understanding. So, but it, what, what we're reading about in the scriptures is so beautiful because it is demonstrating the psychology of people and how people are and how they operate and how they think. And this is over the course of a thousand years. We're reading about people and how they think. And they think the same way. It's how you know the Bible is a true book. The truest and the realest book ever. Because, again, we're reading about the psychology of people. You give, They will sell themselves in a moment of desperation. And they will thank you, the person they sold themselves to, not realizing that what they've done truthfully is commit a generational economic suicide. That's far worse than them dying right there. Far worse than the hardship that they would have to face right there. But it's people. It's how they are. So read. Um, it says, let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. Mm -hmm. And Joseph, Please let us serve. Please let us be slaves to Pharaoh. Please. Okay. If it's going to save us. Please. Right? Go ahead. It says, and Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt unto this day, that Pharaoh should have the fifth part except the land of the priests only, which became not Pharaoh's. So now that became the mandate. 20%. It was essentially a 20% tax on everything. Everything that you had was taxed, 20% of it was taxed and given to Pharaoh. Right? So read. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, mm -hmm. and they had possessions therein, and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Mm -hmm. So here we are. We're growing now as a people. We're becoming a nation. We're multiplying. We're having children. They're having children, etc. Right, read. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. Mm -hmm. So the whole age of Jacob was 140 and 7 years. So our father Jacob lived to be 147 years old. Read. Okay. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. Mm -hmm. Now, Israel. Who Israel? The man Israel. Okay. As a nation, Israel will never die to save the Most High. Okay. But the man Israel was getting ready to die at 147. Read. And he called his son Joseph uh -huh. and said unto him, where we at? Uh, verse 329. Still 47? Yes, sir. Go ahead. If now I have found grace in thy sight, uh -huh. put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, mm -hmm. and deal kindly and truly with me. So it's what, what they call a yaric oath. Put your hand on your thigh. Put your hand on the man's thigh. Read. Come. Uh, and truly with me, bury me not, I pray thee, in mm -hmm. Egypt. But, the, the, what did he say? It says, uh, and truly with... It's like him. Put thy hands... Under my thigh mm -hmm. and deal kindly and truly with me. So Jacob is telling his son, Deal kindly and truly. Be nice to me. Grant me what I'm saying and be truthful and honest. Right? Promise me. Read. Huh. Hold on. Go ahead. Come. It says, um, and tr truly with me, bury me not, mm -hmm. I pray thee, in Egypt. See that, Jacob. Our father Jacob gives us such a, a good, he, he, please, please, son, don't bury me in Egypt. Right? Our father Jacob gives us such a, a great example. We have to analyze what's going on. He goes to Egypt. But when he, with his sons. But in Egypt, he lives separately from the Egyptians. He deals deceptively with the Egyptian government. Lives deceptively amongst the Egyptians. I mean, lives separately from the Egyptians. And refuses to be buried with the Egyptians. What does this tell us about our father Jacob? He hated those goddamn Egyptians. He hated Egyptians. 
He hated the Canaanites. He hated these damn Hamites. He hates the heathen. Does that mean that he couldn't live peaceably around them? Does that mean he couldn't diplomatically have conversations and dealings with them? No. But God damn it, he hated them. He did not want to marry with them. He did not want to live amongst them. He did not want to follow their customs. He did not want to become one people with them. And he damn sure didn't want to be buried in the place where these people venerate the dead. He showed us how to hate. See, we get so caught up on hate, we think hate is words. And, and, and speaking about the disdain that we have for the things that people do. But Jacob showed us hate, for real. He showed us hate, man. All praises to Yahweh, Bashem, Yahweh, Shai, because our father and our forefathers in general showed us how to hate indeed. You see what I'm saying? Showed us how to hate indeed. Not in word, hate for real. Because they want separate. The white man shows us hate all the time, but the only white people that you want to say hate us are the ones that are vocal about it. But these other white folks still hate you. But they hate you indeed. Our forefather Jacob showed how to hate indeed. He would look at Hamite in the face, smile, talk to him, have a at the meet, enter into a peaceful. Yeah, we gonna be at peace, but we gonna do our thing over here, away from y'all. And no, I don't want none of your daughters. And no, I don't want my uh, uh, daughters get with none of your sons. You see what I'm saying? Yes, I'll live in Egypt, but I want to live away from the Egyptians and I don't want to be buried amongst these bastards. That's what our father Jacob showed us. A prime example of hating and being separate and holy indeed as a nation of people. We should learn that lesson from our father. Right? So read. It says, But I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. Mm -hmm. Joseph said, I'm going to take you out of Egypt. I'm going to bury you out of Egypt. And there's certain of these men. And you'll see as we read into the historical account of Exodus, uh, Joseph's bones wasn't left in Egypt. You're going to find that out. Because there's something about the bones and things of this nature that we'll read about scripturally and deal with the burial practice of Israelites. Right? But go ahead. It says, and he, and he said, Swear unto me, and he swore unto him, and Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass, this is chapter 48, and it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick, and he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Mm -hmm. It says, And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. Mm -hmm. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply and multiply thee and I'll make thee and I'll make of thee a multitude of people and will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt before I came unto thee in, into Egypt are mine. As how the Joseph. Mm -hmm. It says, and as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan, in the way, when yet there was but a little way to come unto Ephrath, and I buried her there in the way of Ephrath, the same as Beth Bethlehem, mm -hmm. and then also thy seed. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both. Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, mm -hmm. and brought them near unto him. It says, And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands uh, wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, 
the God which fed me all my life long until this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father had laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's so, head. So Joseph was upset, because of course in our custom, it's about the firstborn, and the greater blessing falling upon the firstborn son. Joseph, I mean, uh, Israel, Jacob, is, is given this blessing that Joseph thinks should be going to Manasseh to Ephraim, to Aparium, right, Read. It says, And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, mm. for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his he head. He said, Oh, the pops, what you doing, man? This is the first, this is the oldest, right, Read. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son. He said, I know what I'm doing, nigga. No, nah, you know what I'm saying? But he said, I know what I'm doing, son. Okay, it's in the spirit. Sometimes there are things that may not go according to custom, uh, and it's by the spirit. Um, and that's what was compelling our father Jacob in this instance. So read. Tom, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he. Manasseh will be great, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he. Right, read. And his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Uh huh. Shall become what? A multitude of nations. Oh yeah, forty-eight eighteen. Yes, sir. Oh, really? Most high in Christ. So, I want to show y'all. I want to share the screen with y'all real quick. It say Ephraim shall become this multitude of nations. So, this is important um, to understand. Very important to understand because this comes into play here in the. Uh, in the New Testament. No, 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 not that. So it says he shall become a multitude of nations. Multitude of nations, right? So we're going to take a look at multitude. Strong's H4393. Fullness. See that? Fullness. Nations. All right. This is Goya. Nation, right? Now watch this. Gentile, right? So when we read here in Romans eleven twenty five, it says, "For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, that ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles." What Jacob said to Ephraim here was that his seed shall become the fullness of the Gentiles. So when they say the fullness of the Gentiles becoming, it's talking about the final unification of northern and southern kingdom. And the reconciliation of all the Israelites who have been Hellenized or influenced by any other heathen nation, have fell by the wayside, have become stones casted out, gathering all of Israel back together under Hamashiach Yehoshua, which he'll also reference in the next chapter, unto him shall the gathering of the people be, which is the Christophany. This is what Jacob is talking about here. So when anybody tries to go to Romans 11 to try to tell you that non-Israelites are being grafted in, you take them right here to the conclusion. The conclusion of this is that the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And you take them right here to Genesis 48 and 19, where it says that Ephraim shall become the fullness of the Gentile. Meaning the northern kingdom headed by the tribe of Ephraim, who are predominantly now known as the so-called Puerto Rican man, as well as other people in the earth, like the Yoruba. Okay? Um, just so people can understand, they become a multitude, and they now now they are the epitome. They are the archetype of the Latino communities. You see what I'm saying? On that small little island that they come from, 
they become a multitude, millions upon millions of people. All right, and they also have a portion of them that stayed with the southern kingdom and came up into Africa with us and are now known today as the people of Yoruba, which Yoruba, go back to the Hebrew word for Jeroboam, Yeroboam, Yeroboiwa. You see what I'm saying? That's where it comes from because that was the first king that came out of Ephraim to rule the northern kingdom when the kingdom split and became the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. See what I'm saying? So these people have become a great multitude of people, millions of people, and that's what Jacob is telling Joe at this time, right? So read. Come. It says, um, and he blessed them that day, saying, and thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh, and he said Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again into the land of your fathers. Mm -hmm. You go back to Canaan. Jacob's dying, but he said, You gonna go back to Canaan. Read. Come. It says, Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the land, out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Uh huh. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together. Well, read that last part. Uh, it says, Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. So we have to understand something. He said, I have given you one portion out of the land of the Amorite. Right? Read that last, Read it again, Bible Shah. Uh, it says, Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren. One portion above. What does that mean, one portion above? Every other tribe gets one allotment. Joseph gets one. Two allotments. I'll show you. They have he has something called Eastern Manasseh and Western Manasseh. This side and this how big Manasseh was. You see that? Boom, boom. You have Ephraim here. But Manasseh got this west of the Jordan and east of the Jordan. Two sides of Manasseh. See what I'm saying? Everybody else only gets one side one allotment. Here's Judah. Here's Simeon. Here's me. You see that? Everybody got one. One, 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 one. Manessa got two. See that? They got two. Why? Because, read it again. Come. It says, um, which I took out of the hand. It's like, verse 22. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren. One portion above. Everybody gets one, 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 one. Here's Ephraim, Manessa, and then Manessa got two sides. And it gets so bad that that they displaced Dan, as you'll find later in history. Read. Come. Which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with mm -hmm. my sword and with my bow. There you go. Took it from the Hamite. Right, read. Come. This is Genesis 49 and 1. Mm. So y'all know what Genesis 49 is about. We're going to get into it through the spirit and power of Yahweh by Shem Yahweh Shah. What you call the two, part of the, the foundational, fundamental aspect and building block of the 12 tribes breakdown right so let's go through it um, and jacob called unto his sons and said gather yourselves together that i may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days uh -huh. and when the last days. Yeah, a lot of people like to zoom past this part the last days jacob said listen something's gonna happen i'm getting ready to die i'm gonna tell you what's gonna befall you in the last days read on Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, uh -huh. and hearken unto Israel your father. Mm -hmm. Reuben, thou art my firstborn. That's right, go ahead. My might and the beginning of my strength. Uh -huh. The excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Right, so they are dig a dignified people, a royal people. And we see this exemplified through the dress style, right, of the, or the, the garb and the regalia. That is worn to this day by the Seminole Indian. Read. Unstable as water, mm -hmm. thou shalt not excel. That's right. So being unstable as water is dealing with the nomadic nature of the Seminole Indian. Them not being able to excel is a curse that came upon them for defiling their father's bed. It is getting ready to elaborate upon and it's going into how they have not excelled. Though they were able to fight the white man. And, and, and not sign a treaty with him and are still technically at war with the white man right now is the Seminole Indian. They have not been able to excel whatsoever. I was just in Florida. They're marginalized, they're destroyed, they're distraught, they're destitute on the reservations just like all the other Native American tribes. Thou shalt not excel, read on. Because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, uh -huh. then defilest thou it, 
He went up to my couch. Read on. Simeon and Levi are brethren. They are what? Brethren. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Read on. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitation. That's right. So you have Simeon and Levi are brethren. All the 12 tribes are brethren. Right? So why is it that Simeon and Levi are being singled out as brethren? Because we are sharing that island of Hispaniola. Because we are so closely knit to each other, but we can't stand one another. That's why it says instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. It's talking about the cruel nature of the so-called Dominican and Haitian man. It's talking about the cruel instruments that are utilized through witchcraft of the so-called Haitian and Dominican man. The instruments of cruelty in our habitation. Read on. Come. O oh my soul, come not thou into their secret. Come not into their secret. What is their secret? Read on. Con, unto their assembly. Their secret assembly. The secret assembly is dealing with the witchcraft rituals that we partake in upon that island. Read on. Mine honor, be not thou united. My honor, be not thou united. Because of our cruelty, because of our sins, because of the witchcraft that we partake in, the Most High God says he's going to stick us together, but we're not going to be united. And that's why you see the tension between Dominicans and Haitians today. Right? Read. For in their anger they slew a man, uh -huh. and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Read on. Cursed be their anger. Cursed is our anger. We are a very angry people, a cruel people at times. And God has cursed our anger at the uh, the, the the request, the petition of our father Jacob. Read on. For it was, sorry, for it was fierce uh -huh. in their wrath, for it was cruel. Read on. I will divide them in Jacob. We are divided now. That island is divided. Where at once it was unified, it is now divided. A western third for Haiti and two thirds of the east for the Dominican Republic. Right? Read. And scatter them in Israel. And we scatter them in Israel, especially the so called Haitian men. Right? So read. It says Judah. Uh huh. Th Judah, the so called African American. Read on. Thou art whom thy brethren shall praise. The so called African American man is the top man in the earth. Out of all the tribes, out of everybody, the so called African American man is whom thy brethren shall praise. All the other tribes, black and Latino, Look to Judah for leadership, to be inspired, to follow the trends, etc. Judah is setting these trends. He is whom thy brethren should praise, and ultimately it also refers to Hamashiach Yahweh, being the king coming out of the lineage of the tribe of Judah, being the lion of the tribe of Judah. Read on. Come. It says, Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Uh -huh. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thy enemies, prophetically talking about them taking on their taking an overtaking the enemy rather. And they're here, and they live amongst their enemy. Unlike the majority of the rest of the tribes, though you have portions of us other tribes that are here in America amongst our enemy, and our enemies face the white man. They, as almost in totality, are dwelling in the neck of their enemies right now, which puts them at a great advantage for putting their hand in the neck of their enemies when the time comes to save the Most High God. So read on. It says, Thy father's children shall bow down before That's right. Him. Everybody's going to bow before Hamashiach Yahweh, who comes from the lineage of Yahweh or Judah. Right? So read. And Judah is a lion's well. Uh huh. From like a young lion, read. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. Thou art, thou art gone up from the prey. So now, in, in reference to right now, Judah is not in a predatory state. Judah is not preying upon the enemy like they rightfully and likely should be. Logically, they should be. They've gone up. They've departed from the prey. Right? Read. He stooped down. Uh -huh. He couched as a lion. See, he stooped down. He went to bow down as a lion. Read. And as an old lion, uh -huh. who shall rouse him up? But he didn't just bow down like a servant. He bowed down ready to pounce. But he's staying down, and he's hard to rouse up like an old lion. But once he's roused up, no matter who the damn lion is, you rouse a lion up and he pounces. He's going to pounce. He's going to kill. He's going to attack. He's going to do what he needs to do. So right now, Judah is in that stoop or couch position. Right? It's all that prophecy. So read on. Come. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Rulership shall not depart from Judah. Leadership shall not depart from Judah. Read. Nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Uh-huh. Until Shiloh come. Until who? Shiloh come. Read on. And unto him shall be the gathering, shall the gathering of the people. Talking be. about Hamashiach, Yahweh Shiloh means a man of tranquility, which is a reference to Isaiah the ninth chapter when it calls him the Prince of Peace. When Shiloh come, all the tribes will be gathered back, and the kingdom will be set aright. That's what that's talking about. Keep going. Binding his foal unto the vine, uh -huh. and his ass's coat unto the choice vine. Uh -huh. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Read on. See now, a lot of people say this means that. Judah likes to drink. 
This has nothing to do with Judah drinking. This is what you would call a, a Hebraic idiom. This is just talking about abundance, flourishing. Um, it's talking about when Shiloh comes and implements his kingdom, that the tribe of Judah is going to flourish. That's what it means when it says, uh, he shall wash his garments in wine. That's how much grapes he's going to have. That's how abundant his harvest is going to be. That's what that's a reference to, right? So go to verse 12. Uh, verse 12, his eyes shall be red with wine. C continually reiterating how much produce they're going to have. Read on. And his teeth white with milk. How many cows he's going to have. It's going to produce milk. That's what it's talking about. So for, uh, verse 13. Uh, verse 13, Zebulon. Now Zebulon, the so-called Central Americans, Guatemalan, uh, Panamanian, indigenous Panamanian, uh, uh, the descendants of the ancient Mayan Empire, right? The Honduran, the Costa Rican. The Nicaraguan. You understand what I'm saying? Go ahead. Zebulon the, shall, El, the El Salvadorian. Read on. Zebulon shall dwell at the haven of the sea. Where you dwell at the haven of the sea, that's dealing with predominantly the Panama Canal as well as the various other canals that are there that uh, are, are upon that isthmus that's known as Central America or Mesoamerica. That's a haven of the sea. This is an undeniable, indisputable fact that that's what Central America is. Right, so Zebulon shall dwell at the haven of the sea, something that ancient Zebulon never was. I want to make that clear. Ancient Zebulon did not dwell at the haven of the sea. Let me show y'all real quick, because a lot of niggas they hate this breakdown, but they don't know how to give what I call a viable antithesis. Right? Here's the sea. Here's Zebulon. Here's the sea. Here's Zebulon. Here's the sea. Here's Zebulon. Can y'all see my cursor when I do that? I don't know if they can see it. Oh, hold on. Can I? Hold on. I don't want to just do a display capture. Okay. You show my cursor? Yeah, okay. Here's the C. Here's Zebulon. Here's another light. You see what I'm saying? C. Here's Zebulon. C. Zebulon. Zebulon is not at the haven of the sea. Mediterranean Sea is here. You see what I'm saying? Here's them. C. Them. They're not at the haven of the sea. They're landlocked. Can't be talking about them. Keep going. Come. It says, and he shall be for an haven of ships. And his border shall be unto Zidon. Uh, his border shall be unto Zidon. That's a reference to the Mayans being bordered and separated from the Aztecs by the ancient Olmecs, who were Zidonians, Hamites that came to the Americas. Okay, so read. Issachar is a strong ass. Issachar is a strong ass. The so called Mexican is a strong ass. The predominant means of transportation for the primitive people of Mexico prior to, of course, automobiles being introduced to them was what? The ass. The ass is a symbol throughout Mexico and it is a metaphor for the hardworking nature and the strength of the so-called Mexican. Issachar is a strong ass. Read on. Couching down between two burdens. Uh, couching between the two burdens. See, because when you see the donkey and it's the symbol that you see throughout Mexico, the donkey with two burdens. What are the two burdens? The sacks that you may put on the donkey's back that are the burdens in which he carries this is symbolic of mexico how because it's between the burdens of its people it separates north america from central and south america so that's the burdens that issachar is carrying just like the burdens that a donkey carry right Reed? and he saw that rest was good uh-huh he saw that rest was good that's what he calls a siesta he saw that rest was good Number one, when they came and they migrated over from Florida as they did according to their history, right? Just going right along with 2nd Ezra 13. They landed in the Americas coming from the east where they landed was Florida. Then they migrated over along with their brothers, the Mayans, the tribe of Zebulon. And they came in from where we are now, Texas. This is all according to their history. They came in from Texas and they migrated southwest. And they came to a land that they called Tenochtitlan which is now called Mexico City, the capital district in Mexico. And when they saw it, they knew it was good. And they built a vast empire. And they built aquaponic gardens. And they built something that the white man could never replicate or duplicate. Powerful kingdom. Built powerful pyramids. Even though they did certain wicked things there, they built 
beautiful megalithic structures that cannot be replicated or duplicated. They saw that rest was good. And they commemorate rest being good through a process or through a, a, a tradition that they call a siesta, which is a midday nap. Okay? Read. In the land that was pleasant. No, it was a pleasant land that they found there in Mexico. Then they did something called land filling. And they, 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 they did... They, they did so many agriculturally advanced things in their empire because that land was good. They saw that that land was good. Read. Okay. Uh, and bowed his shoulder to bear. Uh, and bowed his shoulder to bear and what? And became a servant unto tribute. And eventually in all of that, they became servants unto tribute. How did they become servants unto tribute? Through the invasion of the Spaniard, Hernan Cortez, etc. They became servants unto tribute. They became slaved to the Spanish man. Right, read. Um, Dan shall judge his people. Uh -huh. Dan shall judge his people. How did, how and when did Jan, Dan judge his people? Through Samson. Read. As one of the tribes of Israel. Uh huh. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, uh -huh. an adder in the path, read. that biteth the horse's heels, uh -huh. so that his riders shall fall backward. That's right. That was all done through Samson, because after Samson, we see the tribe of Dan be diminished and dwindled. Even in the book of Judges, we read about Samson in the book of Judges. A couple chapters later, you understand that Manasseh grows so large that Dan is utterly displaced by Manasseh. So we see even within the book of Judges, the rise and then the rapid decline of the tribe of Dan. So this is talking about that time period when they rose up as a judge through Samson and then they were, uh, uh, bit the, the horse's heel and the horse fell back. That was Samson taking uh, uh, and liberating us from the Philistines during that time period. Right, so read. I have waited for thy salvation, O Yahweh. Uh -huh. Gad, a troop shall overcome him. Gad, the so-called Native American Indian. A troop shall overcome him. He was overcome by the U.S. cavalry. Read. But he shall overcome at the last. But at the last he shall overcome. And we see in that shape up and start now. They're getting sick of these pipelines that you build. It, right? They're getting ready to be real sick because guess what? Their money has been cut from the government in this government shutdown. They get ready to be sick of that. In Canada, the First Nations, which are a group of Gadites in Canada, they have declared war on the Canadian government. They're sick of these missing Native American girls. These Native American girls getting sold into slavery on ships currently throughout the Great Lakes as they are. They get ready to be sick of that and they get ready to rise up off of them reservations. They're going to rise at the last to save the Most High. Right? So read. Out of Asher, his bread shall be fat. Out, out of Asher. Asher, which is your Colombians to Uruguayans, with emphasis on the Brazilians who are smack dab in the middle of uh, the, the, the allotment of Asher in his day and age when it says, read that part again. Uh, out of Asher, his bread shall be fat. His bread shall be fat. Understand that. So I'm going to show you something. Let's go to... This is what you, uh, for a carnival, this cuisine that they eat, man, is infamously fattening. It's infamously what you would call fat. What, what they talk about scripturally is the royal dainties, etc. Um, this is what they have in Brazil. It, it, it takes the cake as far as fat bread. I'm going to tell you that now. Um, they're not the only country that has carnival. I know it's big in Haiti, it's big in St. Lucia, it's big in Trinidad. They have the, the American version in New Orleans called Mardi Gras, but can't, don't nobody eat like they do down there in the land of Asher, which Asher also means happy. We know the happiest country in the world multiple years was Colombia, which is in that same landmass, but go ahead. Come on. It says, um, 
and he shall yield royal dainties. Mm-hmm. These are the royal dainties that the desserts I just showed you. Right, so read. Naphtali is a hind lamp loose. Uh huh. He giveth goodly words. That's right. He, the, 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 uh, uh, Naphtali is a hind lamp loose, dealing with, again, the migratory pattern of the indigenous peoples of Argentina and Chile, as well as, um, what was that? Then the choir was just breaking down. The goodly words, how there are so few swear words, in, or what you would call bad words, in the dialect in which they speak. And the majority of the way that they speak is actually vastly pleasant you see this in their language even when you juxtapose it to the type of spanish and various other dialects that the people around them speak that give them goodly words right so go ahead Con joseph is a fruitful bow and um, we know joseph yawasap yawasap is a fruitful bow infamously stereotypically fruitful bow as you talk and people make the references about the puerto rican that they make and how many kids they have and all the cars they park on the lawn etc Right? He is a fruitful bow, Reed. Even a fruitful bow by a well. A fruitful bow by a well. A well is a natural source of water that's subterranean, right? Now you have a bow, which is a branch, a branch that grows on a tree. If you have a tree that's rooted and its roots run underground near where there is a natural source of subterranean water, it'll be well watered and it will grow immensely. So a fruitful bow by water is something that's going to grow out of control. And that's what the Puerto Rican man has done. Read. Puerto Rican and the Cuban man. Read. Come. It says, even a fruitful bow by a well uh -huh. whose branches run over the wall. Branches run over the wall, meaning they came from that small island of Puerto Rico. And that small island of Puerto Rico could not contain them. And now there is even more Puerto Ricans outside of that island than there is on that island. So that's their, their uh, uh, being a fruitful bow by a well and their branches ran over the wall. Right, so read. The archers have sorely grieved him. Uh, the archers have sorely grieved him. They have been oppressed. I'm going to show you how the archer most recently sorely grieved him when that devil DJ Trump went down there to Puerto Rico and started shots. shooting jump shots with the damn paper towels when they were rocked with a hurricane. See that? That's an archer sorely grieving Joseph. Read. Con. Grieved him and shot at him and hated him. Mm -hmm. But his bow abode him strength, and the armors of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. Uh huh, read on. From thence is the shepherd the stone of Israel. Uh huh, go ahead. Even by the God of thy father, who shall help thee, and by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast. It said the blessings of heaven above and the blessings of the deep that lieth under. Let's talk about that treasure. That's when they that see. <coughs> <coughs> Go ahead. Come. It says, Blessings of the deep that lie thunder, mm -hmm. blessings of the breast and of the womb. Mm -hmm. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors mm -hmm. unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Mm -hmm. Verse 27. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. This is talking about the ravenous nature and the spirit of of the West Indian, of the Jamaican, the Trinidadian, uh, the Bayesian, they have this that ravenous wolf-like spirit. We see that come out in their music and the way they sing and they howl and they be reggae, be a dance hall and the way that they dance, the way that they talk, it's, it's like unto a wolf, right? Read. In the morning he shall devour the prey. In the morning he shall devour the prey, right? Read. And at night he shall divide the spoil. He's talking about a, a, a lot of the ways that they maneuver as far as through the, the criminal underbelly, dealing with the way they divide the spoil, be it the shower posse and the various other infamous gangs that they had to come out of Jamaica, right? Robbing, stealing, things of that nature. We know that they're known for that. This is an undeniable fact. That's what dividing the spoil is dealing with. Stealing, right, Read Verse 28, all these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is it that their father spake unto them mm -hmm. and blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing, he mm -hmm. blessed them. There you go. That That's the prophecy. It's a prophecy from our father, a prophet, Yaquab Jacob, whose name was changed to Yasharala, Israel. He gave this prophecy that helps us to indicate and identify whom the tribes are in the latter days. Right? So go ahead. Come. It says, um, verse 29, and charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron. Get me away from here. Go take me into Canaan. Go ahead. Um, it says, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, 
which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite for possession of a burying place. Mm. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife, and there I buried Leah. The purchase of the field and of the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. Where you at? Uh, chapter 50. Uh -huh. um, it says, And Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father and the physicians embalmed Israel. So, um, verse 3. And forty days were fulfilled for him, for so are the fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed, and the Egyptians mourned for him threescore and ten days. And when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, my father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die, in my grave, which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan. There shalt thou bury me. Now therefore let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. And Pharaoh said, Go up, and bury thy father, according as he made thee swear. And Joseph went up to, his bur up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. And all the house of Joseph, and his brethren, and his father's house, only their little ones, and their flocks, and their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. And they came to the threshing, threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond Jordan, and there they mourned with a great a very sore lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. And when the inhabitants of the land... The Canaanites saw the morning in the floor of Atad. They said, This is a grievous morning to the Egyptians. Wherefore, the name of it was called uh, Abel, Mizraim, Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. And his sons did unto him according as he commanded them. And his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham bought with the field for a possession of a burying place of Ephron the Hittite before Mamre. Verse 14. And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father, after he had buried his father. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us, and will certainly requit us all the evil which we did unto him. Uh, it says, and, when, and they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brother, yeah, I mean, that just goes to show if, if a brother can forgive his brother, his brothers for selling him into slavery and telling mm -hmm. his father they died, that he died. What, how, you can't forgive someone for, for what, stepping on your Jordans? Or kind of petty crime, <laughs> some little petty, something petty that Jake will do. That's right. It's, but you want forgiveness from the Most High. Uh, and his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am in the place of God. For am I not? For am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Uh, verse 21. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones, and be comforted them, and spake kindly unto them. It says, And Joseph dwelt in Egypt. He Basically, what he's telling them is, I wasn't just being cool for Pops. Just because Pops is dead, I'm, I'm still, everything is still going to be cool. You see what I'm saying? So go ahead. Come. It says, Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them, and spake kindly unto them. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived in hundred and ten years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children also of Makur, the son of Manasseh, great, great grandkids. Go ahead. were brought up upon Joseph's knees. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, 
God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from hence. So he said, look, the same way we did like Pops, when the Most High bring us up out of here, you get my bones, you take my bones the hell up out of here, and you take them into Israel with y'all. All right? And this is all, there's histor historical stuff that goes with this as well. Um, I got to find an exact document, but they literally went, I wish I, I'm tripping because I should have had this prepared, but they literally went and got his bones. And this is, there's a, um, there's like a little mini pyramid where they raided and got his bones up out of, and they have that archaeological site. Um, but go, oh, let me, you know what? One of the brothers is called Averis. Averis. A V A R I S. R I S. Oh no, that's the brother. That's the uh, that's the brother. Um, is it Tazaparan? Is that his name in Philly? Tazaparan is that Philly? Tazaparan is in Orlando. So I, I'm thinking of the brother Ariel. Ar Ariel is in Philly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because right, that's I, I, I can see Michael talking. Are you sure it's called Averis? Are we all? Yeah, I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing that problem. A -A I guess. Joseph's tomb. Joseph's tomb in Egypt. Okay. Yeah, I think that might be. But yeah. remember how they they, they they colored that in. Yeah, well that 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 might be it, but I, I'm not sure. I gotta look. I need I need to see the article. I don't need to see the picture. No, that that's that's certainly not. It. The water said, brother Carlos. The water. Yeah, I'm very y'all telling me this. I don't, that, that don't help me too much, to be quite frank with you, because that's not coming up at all. I, I, I went into this years ago. I remember I was arguing with um Larry, Professor Larry on Sonetta, and I busted him with it. So, 
Jesus. Send us that because that's not that ain't pull it up right. Oh, it might. No, I sure don't. <laughs> this nigga just right here. Look, look, these people are so crazy. I want to show you how this out here. Right, not there. So look, this is the statue that they found, and this is how they recreated it. A white, a red-haired white man with a, like a, a carrot top afro. They, they got this from this, though. You see what I'm saying? Like, what? How does this look like this? And then they put this colorful ass coat on him. He didn't even have a coat. If y'all paid attention a couple weeks ago, he didn't even have a coat of many colors. You see? 12 pillars. Okay, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Now it's all coming back to me. The palace had an interesting aspect. It initially contained 12 pillars at its entrance. and had 12 primary tombs behind it. Right, so yeah, they think that these are all about the 12 tribes hold on this is the foot then they recreate it's so crazy man. <sighs> yeah okay in a shrine in the front of the pyramid tomb the remains of a colossal statue of a Semitic ruler were found. He was depicted as wearing a multicolored coat. The bones of the person buried here were found to be missing. This again fits the promise made by Joseph's family that they would take his bone. So this is the uh, point I'm making. This is the, this is the, the info. Okay, y'all was right. It's a virus. They call it a virus. All right. So yeah, but go ahead. Back to the back to the scripture. Um, speaking on the last verse, it says, verse 26, so Joseph died being 110 years old, mm -hmm. and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. There you go. And that's what we were just looking at through the spirit. That was it on that? Yes, sir. All praise y'all, Bashim Yahushua. We now gonna move to the Torah portion. Let's go to start at Numbers 28. We'll be 28 to 31, and then we'll go to chapter 35. All right, so go ahead. Numbers chapter 28, verse 1. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel, and say unto them, 
my offering and my bread for my sacrifices made by fire. For a sweet savour unto me shall ye observe to offer unto me in their due season. And thou shalt say unto them, This is the offering made by fire, which ye shall offer unto Yahweh. Two lambs of the first year, without spot, day by day, for a continual burnt offering. The one lamb shalt thou offer in the morning, and the other lamb shalt thou offer at even. And a tenth part of an ephah of flour for a meat offering, mingled with the fourth part of an hin of beaten oil. It is a continual burnt offering, which was ordained in Mount Sinai for a sweet savor, a sacrifice made by fire unto Yahweh. And the drink offering thereof shall be the fourth part of an hen for the one lamb. In the holy place shalt thou cause the strong wine to be poured unto Yahweh for a drink offering. And the other lamb shalt thou offer at even as the meat offering of the morning. And as the drink offering thereof, thou shalt offer it a sacrifice made by fire of a sweet savor unto Yahweh. And on the Sabbath day, two lambs of the first year without spot and two tenth deals of flour for a meat offering mingled with oil and the drink offering thereof. This is the burnt offering of every Sabbath beside the continual burnt offering and his drink offering. And in the beginnings of your months ye shall offer a burnt offering unto Yahweh, two young bullocks and one ram, seven lambs of the, of the first year without spot, and three tenth deals of flour for a meat offering mingled with oil for one bullock, and two tenth deals of flour for a meat offering mingled with oil for one ram. And a several tenth deal of flour mingled with oil for a meat offering unto one lamb, for a burnt offering by a sweet savor, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord. And their drink offerings shall be, in, shall be half an hen of wine unto a bullock, and a third part of an hen unto a ram, and a fourth part of an hen unto a lamb. This is the burnt offering of every month throughout the months of the year. And one kid of the goats for a sin offering unto Yahweh shall be offered, beside the continual burnt offering and his drink offering. And in the fourteenth day of the first month is the Passover of Yahweh. And in the fifteenth day of this month is the is the feast. Seven days shall, uh, shall unleavened bread be eaten. It says, In the first day sh uh, shall be in holy convocation. Ye shall do no manner of servile work therein. But ye shall offer a sacrifice made by fire for a burnt offering unto Yahweh. Two young bullocks and one ram. And seven lambs of the first year, they shall be unto you without blemish. And their meat offering shall be a, f a flour mingled with oil. Three tenth deals shall ye offer for a bullock, and two tenth deals for a ram. A several tenth uh, deal shalt thou offer for every lamb throughout the seven lambs. And one goat for a sin offering to make an atonement for you. Ye shall offer these beside the burnt offering in the morning, which is for a continual burnt offering. After this manner ye shall offer daily throughout the seven days the meat of the sacrifice made by fire of a sweet savor unto Yahweh. It shall be offered beside the continual burnt offering and his drink offering. And on the seventh day ye shall have an holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work. Also on the day of the first fruits, when ye bring a new meat offering unto Yahweh, after your weeks be out. So, I can stop it briefly. Um, we're reading about the intricacies of the sacrifices that go into the high holy days now. Um, so that's why when people, and I've gotten this question a lot over, over the years, how do you celebrate a high, this high holy day? To be quite honest with you, you can't. We're reading about how to celebrate a high holy day. We're reading about intricate details in regards to sacrifices that must be made that we don't have the ability to make in this time. So we can't. We just get together. Unless there's special stipulations, like in the case of Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread or Day of Atonement, we're just literally getting together and eating and thinking about what we used to do and what we're going to do and enjoying each other's company. That's all a feast day is. Outside of Pesach, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and Day of Atonement. Period. So read. Huh. And in the day of the first fruits, when ye bring a new meat offering unto the Lord, after your weeks be out, ye shall have an holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work. But ye shall offer the burnt offering for a sweet savor unto Yahweh, two young bullocks, one ram, seven lambs of the first year, and their meat offering of flour mingled with oil, three tenth deals unto one bullock, two tenth deals unto one ram, a several tenth deal unto one lamb throughout the several seven lambs. And one kid of the goats to make an atonement for you. 
You shall offer them beside the continual burnt offering and his meat offering. They shall be unto you without blemish and their drink offerings. Numbers 29 and 1. And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, ye shall have an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. And ye shall offer a burnt offering for a sweet savor unto Yahweh, one young bullock, one ram, and seven lambs of the first year without blemish. And their meat offerings shall, ye, shall be of flour mingled with oil, three tenth deals for a bullock, and two tenth deals for a ram and one tenth deal for one lamb throughout the seven lambs, and one kid of the goats for a sin offering to make an atonement for you, beside the burnt offering of the month, and his meat offering, and the daily burnt offering, and his meat of the offering, and their drink offerings, according unto the manner for a sweet savor of sacrifice made by fire unto Yahweh. And ye shall have on the tenth day of the seventh month an holy convocation, and ye shall afflict your souls, ye shall, do, ye shall not do any work therein. This is what you call the day of atonement. Read. But ye shall offer a burnt offering unto Yahweh for a sweet savor, one young bullock, one ram, and seven lambs of the first year. They shall be unto you without blemish. And their meat offering shall be of flour, fine, uh, flour mingled with oil, three tenth deals to a bullock, and two tenth deals to one ram. A several a several tenth deal for one lamb throughout the seven goat lambs. Uh, uh, Slack it. Mm. Verse 11. One kid of the goats for a sin offering, beside the sin offering of atonement. And the continual burnt offering, and the meat offering of it, and their drink offerings. And on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, ye shall have an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work, and ye shall keep a feast unto Yahweh seven days. And ye shall offer a burnt offering, a sacrifice made by fire of a sweet savor unto Yahweh, thirteen young bullocks, two rams, and fourteen lambs of the first year. And they shall be without blemish. And their meat offerings shall be of flour mingled with oil. Three tent deals unto every bullock of the thirteen bullocks, two tent deals to each ram of the two rams, and a several tent deal to each lamb of the fourteen lambs, and one kid of the goats for a sin offering, beside the continual burnt offering, his meat offering, and his drink offering. And on the second day ye shall, uh, ye shall offer twelve young bullocks. Where you at? Verse 17. Hold on. Uh, chapter 29. Started, just skip this. Go to 30. I don't know why I have this on here. So oh. I don't want to go too deep into all the sacrifices. Go ahead. Numbers 30 and 1. And uh -huh. Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which Yahweh hath commanded. If a man vow a vow unto Yahweh, uh -huh. or swear an oath to bind his vow so to his soul. If you make an oath or make give a vow to the Most High, if a man do this, read. Con. With a bond... He shall not break his word. You shall not break your word. You swear a vow. You swear an oath to the Most High. You shall not break your word, man. Why y'all got to be careful? Niggas be vowing vows and don't even intend to keep the vows. If you contend it for the moment, but you ain't even get no thought to it. Don't vow a vow if you don't intend to keep it, man. Read. He shall do according to all that proceeded out of his mouth. Whatever you say, you better do it. Read. If a woman also vow a vow, but if a woman vows a vow, read unto Yahweh uh -huh. and bind herself by a bond. Read on. Being in her father's house, mm -hmm. being and, in her father's house, she's still under the authority of her father. Read in her youth, uh -huh. and her father hear the vow, uh -huh. and her bond wherewith she had bond, bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace at her. Uh -huh. Then all her vows shall stand. So if a woman vows a vow when she's under her father's authority, and he allows that vow then the vow stands but if he disallows that vow that vow was never made read and every bond wherewith she hath uh, bound her soul shall stand mm -hmm. but if her father disallow her in the days of, that he heareth not any of her vows or of her bonds wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand and Yahweh shall forgive her because her father disallowed her mm -hmm. and if she had at all in husband when she vowed or if she has if she's married read on or uttered aught uh, of her lips wherewith she bound her soul mm -hmm. and her husband heard it and held his peace at her in the day that he heard it then her vow shall stand same thing uh, if if the husband is the is the authoritarian figure right read and her bonds wherewith she bound her soul shall stand but if her husband disallowed her on the day that she, he heard it then he shall make her vow what she vowed and 
that which she uttered with her lips, where which she bound her soul, of none effect. And Yahweh shall forgive her. Mm -hmm. But every vow of a widow and of her that is divorced, wherewith they have bound their soul, shall stand against her. And if she vowed in her husband's house, or bound her soul by a bond with an oath, and her husband heard it, and held his peace on her, and disallowed her not, then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. But if her husband hath utterly made them void on the day he heard them, then whatsoever proceedeth out of her lips concerning her vows, or concerning the bond of her soul, shall not stand. Her husband hath made them void, and Yahweh shall forgive her. Every vow and every binding oath to afflict the soul, her husband may establish it, or her husband may make it void. But if her husband altogether hold his peace at her from day to day, then he establisheth all her vows, or all her bonds, which are upon her. He confirmeth them because he held his peace at her in the day that he heard them. But if he shall yeah, when you hear it, if you don't say anything against it, you are confirming it that she's going to be held to the standard. Read. But if he shall any what in any ways make them void after that he hath heard them, then he shall bear her iniquity. These are the statutes which Yahweh commanded Moses between a man and his wife, between the father and his daughter, being yet in her youth in her father's house. So read through thirty one. Uh -huh. Okay, this is Numbers 31 and 1. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites. Afterward shalt thou be gathered unto thy people. And Moses spake unto the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves unto the war, and let them go against the Midianites, and avenge Yahweh of Midian. Yahweh is mad at the Midianites. He's telling us to go to war against the Midianites. Get ready for war. At the command of Yahweh. Read on. Of every tribe, a thousand throughout all the tribes of Israel, shall ye send a war. So there were so there were delivered out of the thousands of Israel a thousand of every tribe, twelve thousand armed for war. And Moses sent them to the war, a thousand of every tribe, them and Phineas the son of Eleazar, the priest, to the war, with the holy instruments and the trumpets to blow in his hand. And they warred against the Midianites as Yahweh commanded Moses, and they slew all the males. And they slew the kings of Midian, beside the rest of them that were slain, namely Evi and Rechem and Zer and Hur and Rabbah, five kings of Midian, Balaam, also the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. They killed all these people, right? So we deal with Balaam, which we read about earlier here in, this, uh, in Numbers, which we didn't read about during this, but we'll read about it in the historical portion of Numbers. Right, so read. Huh. It says... And the children of Israel took all the women of Midian captives and their little ones and took the spoil of all their cattle and all their flocks and all their goods. And they burnt all their cities wherein they dwelt and all their goodly castles with fire. Yeah, but God loves everybody, right? Yeah. Uh, and they took all the spoil and all the prey, both of men and of beasts. And they brought the captives and the prey. So in like, where you at? This verse 31? 12. Yeah, this is 31. Hold on. Just Hold going on. To us going to war. Yeah, this is historical. See, I want to cover this on the history part. So like it. Um, it is all war with Midian. Yeah, I see chapter. that. I want to go. I want to move forward. 35. It looks to be that as well. Yeah, go to. I could go to 35 and, and, and 9. You said what? 35 and 9 just goes into laws concerning, like, if you smite someone, what happens? Or okay, hold on. 35 and 9. And then we all read 335. The city of refuge and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, let's let's get into that. Let's okay. go there. Perfect, perfect. Uh, let's see. Okay, go ahead. Cons. Numbers 35 and 9. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then ye shall appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee thither. That's right, the slayer. That's a manslaughterer, all right? Not a killer, but somebody who kills somebody on accidental or unintentional circumstances. Not a murderer, right? So read. Con, which killeth any person at unawares. And they shall be unto you cities for refuge uh -huh. from the avenger, that the manslayer die not, until he stand before the congregation in judgment. Mm -hmm. And of these cities which ye shall give six cities, so I can, uh, wait, until, until he what? Until uh, until he stand before the congregation in judgment. This is 
so overwhelmingly important to understand. Until he stand before the congregation in judgment. Such an important thing to understand. People think, people have this erratic idea. I want to reference the time when you have an adulteress that is getting ready to be stoned. You have Hamashiach Yehawashai, minding his business, drawing on the ground. He gets dragged into this situation. Christians love this situation. They love it because they analyze it and they take the wrong thing out of it. Right? They go, see, he, he, he broke the law because he didn't stone that adulterous woman. Read that part again. Uh, it says, uh, and they shall be unto you cities for refuge uh -huh. from the avenger, that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation in judgment. Mm. He didn't break the law. He kept the law. Because he knew if this woman was in fact an adulteress, she needed to stand before the congregation in judgment. A group of unruly, angry, an angry mob in the streets does not have license according to the laws of God to stone somebody. Not an angry mob in the streets. Somebody has to stand before a congregation, go before a trial, be found guilty in the sight of of the priests and the judges and the officers who preside over Israel during that time period, then the verdict has to be declared that she is stoned. Then she be stoned. Where's the nigga who she slept with? That nigga gotta die. We're not just stoning people willy-nilly in the streets. You have to stand before the congregation. A trial has to be executed. Due diligence has to be done in order to declare somebody worthy of death. This is what a Christian doesn't understand about that situation. Yeah, come. Getting still, Hamashiach, Yahweh didn't say not to stone her. They also don't analyze that aspect yeah, of the situation. Come. He didn't want. He didn't say anything about it. But the fact is, one must stand before the people. Come. So go ahead. Yeah, just to add on to what you said, um, like like the brother brought out, he never said don't stone her. He just said, okay, who he who doesn't have sin among you, cast the first stone. So hypothetically, if there was per a person that didn't have sin among them, he could have cast the first stone. Hey, if there was a nigga who just he, he, he had sin and just said screw it, I'm gonna just <laughs> stone her any damn way. He wouldn't have stepped in. He was he was never going to step in. He was busy drawing on the ground. But go ahead. Con, it says, And of these cities which ye shall give, six cities shall ye have for refuge. So there's six cities of refuge in the earth. Read. Ye shall give three cities on this side, Jordan, mm -hmm. and three cities shall ye give in the land of Canaan. Right. It shall be cities of refuge. Mm -hmm. These six cities shall be a refuge, both for the children of Israel, and for the stranger, and for the sojourner among them, mm -hmm. that everyone that killeth any person unawares may flee thither. Yeah, you could go there. You can go in the city of refuge. And not be put to death in that city of refuge. Come. Read. And if he smite him with an instrument of iron so that he die, he is a murderer. Mm -hmm. The murderer shall surely be put to death. The murderer can't go to the city of refuge. The murderer has to be killed. But a man, somebody who kills somebody accidentally, they can go in the city of refuge and they can seek refuge there and not be put to judgment. Read. And if he smite him with a thro with throwing a stone, wherewith he may die. An iron instrument. A, a gun would qualify. It's called an iron. It's iron. A cocked iron. You know what I'm saying? That would qualify in this day and time. Read. Uh, wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer. Uh -huh. Or with the stone and stone. But either way, the gun qualifies. Yes. <laughs> you throw in a stone, or you cock an iron. Right, Read. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Uh -huh. Or if he smite him with the, with the hand of a weapon of wood wherewith he may die and he die he is a murderer the murderer shall be so this is death. the different types of you intended to kill somebody because you're hitting them with a, a an instrument of war an instrument of death so that is killing somebody Come right on. read it says that's murdering somebody so you can understand read the revenger of blood himself mm -hmm. shall slay the murderer the revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer the person who is next of kin to the person who's the victim of this murder 
that person is supposed to go and execute this judge. We see this in our people now. You have somebody comes and kills your homeboy. You want to go and kill they, them or one of their homeboys. Where does that come from? The Bible. But it's just misguided now. Our people don't understand it. It's fueled by hatred and envy and jealousy and all wicked things. But the practice of killing and avenging the death of your loved one is biblical. It's just done in a very unbiblical and evil way in this time. But it's very biblical in essence. Huh. Read. It says, when he meeteth him, he shall slay him. As mm-hmm. soon as you see the nigga, you're supposed to kill the nigga. This type of mentality that we see in our people now. Again, they just have it's on sight. Have corrupted. It's on sight with you, man. I'm shooting you niggas on sight. I'm doing X, Y, and Z to you niggas on sight. That's where it comes from the Bible. It's our culture to ride on a nigga as soon as you see him. That's your culture. But you're just doing it wrong for the wrong reasons now. But it's your culture. Go ahead. But if he thrust him of hatred or hurl at him by laying of weight that he die, mm-hmm. or an enmity smite him with his hand that he die, he that smote him shall surely be put to death, mm-hmm. for he is a murderer. Mm-hmm. The revenger of blood shall slay the murderer when he meeteth him. So now it's talking about not just murder in combat, but now premeditated murder. He's a murderer. Kill him. Read. But if he thrust him suddenly without mm-hmm. enmity. Not enmity. The intention behind what happened was accidental, read. Con. Or have cast upon him anything without laying of weight, uh-huh. or with any stone wherewith a man may die, mm-hmm. seeing him not, and cast it upon him that he die, and was not his enemy, neither sought him ha- neither sought his harm, mm-hmm. then the congregation shall judge between the slayer mm-hmm. and the revenger of blood. It says the congregation shall judge between the between slayer. Between the slayer, the person who killed him. The slayer and the revenger. And the blood. revenger, which is the next of kin who now has this right to kill this person. Read. To these judgments. Mm-hmm. And the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger. You just say, no, you can't kill him. We send him to the city of refuge. Read. And the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge, mm-hmm. whether he was fled, and he shall abide in unto it. He shall abide in it unto the death of the high priest, Mm -hmm. which was anointed with the holy oil. Whatever high priest presided over that case. Read. But if the slayer shall at any time come without the border of the city. But if you're the manslayer who was, went through this trial, was called a manslaughterer, not a murderer, a manslaughterer, you get to get safe passage to this city. If you leave that city of refuge, read. Of his refuge, whether he was fled, uh-huh. and the avenger of blood finds him. And you get caught anywhere outside of that city by the person who's been given right to kill you. Read. Without the borders of the city of uh-huh. his refuge, and the avenger of blood killed the slayer, uh-huh. he shall not be guilty of blood. See, so that, that city of refuge, if you're a manslaughterer, or as it says in the scripture, manslayer, that city of refuge become like home base. You can't be touched in the city of refuge. But if you leave, and you're seen by the brother who has right, who is known, has been deemed as a revenger of blood. He can kill you, and he's guiltless. Right? So read. <laughs> so, if, so you better ne- not, never leave that until that high priest die. And then you'll be essentially free and clear. That would be like the statute of limitation on that. The lifespan of the particular high priest that presided over your case. Right, so read. Con. It says, because he should have remained in the city of his refuge until the death of the high priest. Mm-hmm. But after the death of the high priest, the slayer shall return into the land of his possession. So these things shall shall be for a statue of judgment unto you throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. But one witness shall not testify against any person. One witness shall not testify any person read to cause him to die that's right if somebody is worthy of being put to death you gotta have two or three witnesses that's how serious it is huh. read it says moreover um uh, you shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer you shall take no satisfaction if somebody's guilty of murder there's nothing they can do to escape that punishment you shall take no satisfaction in the life of murder why would you take no satisfaction in the life of the white man read but he shall be surely put to death. Mm-hmm. And you shall take no satisfaction for him. That Meaning is, you don't let them bribe you out of this judgment. You kill him. He got to be put to death. He's a murderer. He's got to die. Thus say of the most high read. And he shall take no satisfaction for him that is fled to the city of his refuge. 
that he should come again to dwell in the land until the death of the priest. Mm -hmm. You leave that city of refuge, there's no satisfaction for you. You either stay in the city of refuge, nigga, you face death. Read. So you shall not pollute the lands wherein you are. For blood, it defileth the land. Uh huh. Sure. And the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. Yeah, I know that scripture. How many times you heard it? It can't. Read. Defile not, therefore, the land which ye shall inhabit, wherein I dwell, for I, Yahweh, will dwell among the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. That's it on that. That was what, 35? Yes, sir. All right. Um, with that, that was uh, the Torah portion. Uh, let me take a look at the chat. I guess y'all will I'll take maybe a couple questions. Take a couple, when I say a couple, I mean a couple of questions in the spirit. Um, uh, but yeah, so next week we got the summit again through the spirit and power of Yahweh by Shem Yahweh Shai. January 24th to 27th, Atlanta, Georgia. It's going to affect our live class schedule. We should go live again, like I said, last Monday. And then the Tuesday slash Wednesday, which is this class, we'll go live. We'll probably do an open, like an open forum type of class through the spirit of power. Yahweh by Shem Yahweh Shai. And we get back from the summit, we'll be starting back on this uh, tour and history curriculum through the spirit. So just look out for that, man. Look out for that by the grace of the Most High. I um, hope to see y'all in Atlanta for sure. What days do brothers in San Bernardino meet? Saturdays on Baseline and Waterman. They're in San Bernardino Saturday afternoon. Is it true Chrome Rolls are female Hamite traditions? No, they're not. You can see archaeologically that Hebrew Israelite men wore corn rolls. That's right. Shalom, so Kings of Sakari, all praise Yah, all praise Yah, by Shem Yah, Shai. Uh, what is the purpose of circumcision? To separate us from the nations. Shalom is the transliterated. Uh, Yiddish transliterated version of Shalom. Shalom is the word peace in its most original and ancient form in the Hebraic language. That's what Shalom is. Shalom is modern and it's a Yiddish transliteration. Shalom Patricia Tillman. Is it off to argue with your parents? You shouldn't be arguing with your parents, okay? Let them have it. They don't know nothing nine times out of ten. And if they did know something, they would have taught it to you. And you wouldn't have had to learn it in, the, in coming into the truth. They don't know nothing. Whatever, let them have it. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. You don't be arguing with my parents. My mother told me that Jesus Christ gave the Catholic religion to Peter last night. My mother told me that. She reiterated it multiple times. Do you think I argued with her about that? There's no arguing or reasoning with her. She truthfully believes that Jesus Christ invented Catholicism. She doesn't even know who Constantine is. <laughs> you know how crazy that is? Do you think I'm going to argue with her about that? No. Okay, Ma, you believe that? Sure, cool. Great. <laughs> All right. Um, Shamar, Judah, uh, we, we had cornrows in the Bible, braids in the Bible. So, I mean, hey, do what you like with that. What's funny is the logic behind your question, brother. It's funny. Titus is an Israelite.
Exactly, Officer Ray. I mean, you know, what can you do? <laughs> they don't believe. I mean, it's it's very rare. You know, I know certain brothers who have been privileged enough to, you know, also be in the troop with close loved ones and family members, but that's not the story for most of us. Family is a uh, mashpakaka, I believe. Mashpakaka. I believe. In the Paleo Hebrew. On the arm, con raven on the arm. Yeah, I got a couple more minutes of questions. When I say a couple, I mean literally like two, two and change minutes. you leave an organization do you leave the truth and why do some camps move in that spirit no leaving the organization is not leaving the truth we know the law is truth and Yahweh is the way the truth and the life so as long as you are following the laws and um having faith in the mashiach Yahweh you're in the truth um why do some camps move in that spirit you'd have to ask them the ones that do what is the correct answer of asked how is Abraham saved because he was not an Israelite besides Roman 4 and 3? He birthed the Israelites. He's of the chosen lineage. The chosen lineage um, goes from Shem to Eber to him. So that's how you would do that. True story of Noah who was all on the ark. Noah, his three sons, and their four wives. All praises, Billy uh, ever come to Jersey. I mean, we go to New York. We got soldiers in Jersey. Soldier I can run. Soldier Thamia. All right, Belly, I shall warm up. You good. We not good. You can ask the questions because now class is over. So I'm just opening up a question now. I'll give y'all about another minute and a half of questions. <clears throat> yeah, uh, again, next week we'll probably do class Monday and Tuesday, but Situation Room will be off for the summit, but we should do live from a Unity Camp on the summit next Friday. Give me the truth, thanks you brothers. I own a bunch of guns. I'm a work in progress. Can't quite get rid of them yet. Not because I'm attached to them, but street beef from them. <laughs> um, if you don't own your guns illegally, I wouldn't say you would have to get rid of them. <laughs> no, we ain't got nobody in St. Louis currently. Diverse weights is talking about um, a way that they used to falsify things. You know, dealing with bringing things into the temple and putting weighing things in a balance and seeing the value of things monetarily and things of that nature. So it's dealing with, with diverse weights. Does your spirit stick to the same ten? Wait, wait, wait. What? Oh, yeah, yeah. You mean you talking about like when you read, when you regenerate it? Of course. I looked at two second Ezra's and think it's a false book and there are other prophecies proving Yahweh Shah. Um, I don't understand why you would think Second Ezra's is a false book. I don't think there's any indication of that. That's the dude that remember, um remember he said he doesn't believe in Yahweh Shah, but he believes in Second Ezra's and so he got daggered with Second Ezra's. Now now he don't want to go got, now he's uh, gonna throw the whole book away. Yeah, he's yeah. So Hey, you, 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 you're an asshole, pal. Um, Disgusting, man. Seriously. Uh, you know, uh, brother, I agree with truth. Um, the mark of the beast, which is the RFID chip, do I think it has something to do with artificial intelligence? I think that it's going to be a precursor to what they're going to attempt to do with artificial intelligence, but I don't think it's something that they're going to be able to accomplish. Um, but it's going to be like the start of the AI, um, their, their, their hopes to advance AI to this transhumanism and all that, certainly.
Um, uh, we certainly have a lot of fundamental similarities with them. And yes, the heart was certainly my original teacher. He woke me up to the truth through the spirit and power of Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shai. I feel about locks in your organ in my organization. I feel like what what people call locks is actually dreads, and I feel like they're um, not an Israelite custom. I don't feel like they're clean. They're not something that we should be doing. Were there giants on the ark? Certainly there were not giants on the ark. Would you recommend a brother continue doing a 401k? Don't think this system will last. Extra money can go towards building something. I would never recommend a 401k because a 401k is problematic. Um, I would certainly, uh, if you're, if you're going to invest, I would tell you to take your money out of a 401k and maybe get into some uh, insurance or um, you know, forex, something like that, something that's going to give you a, a, a higher likelihood of a return than a 401k. 401ks are so problematic. Send us an email to our register. Um, uh, sorry, but according to some research, Second Ezra is written in the late first century AD. If that's true, then it's false. How? First off, according to some research. What research? How credible is the research? Who did the research? What archaeological references can you point me towards? Uh, quick question. The first five books of Moses, historically when were they written? And according to research, when were they written? Because if I follow your logic for throwing out second Ezra's, I'm going to have to throw away the whole Bible, pal. You're just a, I'm going to be honest with you, you're just an asshole, bro. Is he asking, is he asking, uh, the, is like, like, you can't be a prophet and a priest? Is he a prophet? He I said, it was Ezra a prophet or a priest? Were there people who were priests and prophets? Come on. Was you, Jeremiah a, a prophet? Come on, man. Was Moses a prophet? The major prophets. Was Ezekiel a prophet? Two. Yeah, I was thinking, that's the first thing I thought. That's great. Was Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, a prophet? No, he, he don't. He don't believe in the New Testament. No, he doesn't have to believe know, in the New Testament. It's... Zacharias is a historical figure. <laughs> Tell a rod. Um. King Israel, T E L A R A D. Yeah, I mean, we fuel so many false doctors in this day and age. Yeah, uh, we got Long Beach, man. James Smith, get on, get your ass on the metro, nigga, to the blue line, and go ahead to PCH, brother. That's all I can tell you. God, they, they don't, you know, Officer Ray, they don't know nothing, man. It's all right. A lot of fools out here, but this is why we got to keep. Pumping the truth out through the spirit and power of Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shah, because there's so much lies and falsehood and fly by night weed smoking niggas with keyboard doctrines that somebody's got to combat that in the spirit. So we got to be consistently combating madness and falsehood, you know? That's right. Not being the correct context. Jaden Slayer, I, I want to explain something to you. You're, you're, how long has this nigga been in the truth? Can you tell me? That's not. I mean, I don't know. Not long. Let me explain something to you, Jaden Slayer. If you think for one second that the question you're asking hasn't been dealt with multiple times, is not difficult and is rudimentary, you've deceived no one but yourself. That's right. Go watch any of our non messianic slaughter sessions. Okay, put a quarter in your ass because you played yourself. Yeah. Beautiful trading for it. Yeah, the four hundred one k. I would I would discontinue the four hundred one k. They're taking your money and you're probably never going to see it. You know what I'm saying? I'll be honest with you. You're probably never going to see it. So I would like you said, take the money and invest in something that is a little bit more profitable. I always advise against a four hundred one k. All praises, Brother Tyrison. 
Uh, yeah, we, I'm, I'm out of here, man. Yeah, yeah, good point. And I'll never go on the street for anybody. But with that, we're going to give all praises, honor, and glory to Yahweh by Hashem Yahweh Shai. The water for all the brothers who super chatted again. 12th Masharai Yashra, the Hebrew Summit, Atlanta is going down next week. See y'all there. Shalom. Shalom.